Hello, and welcome to another episode of Leaders of Transformation. Today, I'm so excited to share with you Steve Mariotti. Actually, I spoke to Steve last week, and um, he uh, recommended his book, and I read his book, his memoir, on Saturday night, like the whole thing. It was 288 pages. I, I read it from cover to cover, loved it, and here we are today. I'm going to you know, have a really wonderful conversation. Um, Steve is an award-winning entrepreneurship education advocate. He is the founder of the world-renowned nonprofit, which is uh, short form, it's NIFTY, uh, NIFTY.com, N-F-T-E.com. It stands for Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship. And they've had over a million students that have gone through the program over the last 30 uh, some odd years. He's also the author of this, um, mem this book that I was telling you that I read, which is called Goodbye Homeboy, How My Students Drove Me Crazy and S Inspired a, move a Movement. And it just came out in August. So Steve, welcome to Lisa Transformation. We're excited that you're here today. Nicole, thanks. I'm glad to be here very much. And you were so inspiring in your in in the book and and when we talked i was excited about the interview and that's why we booked it so quickly because i wanted to have you share what it is you're doing it's the epitome of what we're talking about in leaders transformation which is transforming the way people see themselves the way they see others and the way they see the world around them and as you work with these kids from from low-income neighborhoods and at-risk youth that my goodness, you've been working with kids that have been thrown out of the New York school system and, you know, because of violence, extreme violence, and been able to transform, uh, their, literally transform the way they see themselves, others in the world around them, where they were able to graduate, were able to start businesses and literally change their lives. So, so inspiring. Um, so I'm, I'm excited for you to share a little bit more about that. I'm also excited that our guests here are, are I should say our listeners are here and viewers uh, because you're the reason why we do the show is because Steve and I had a great conversation. I can read his book. Awesome. But when we share this, then it can inspire you to say, wow, what can I do? What can I do to become a difference maker in my community? What can I do to, um, even just encourage some of the kids like in this particular case or, case or teach something that I know that I can teach to others that will make a difference in their lives. And so we encourage you to do that. Be inspired by this. Learn and, and extract what Steve is do doing and even look at what he's doing online because it will give you a, a template and model for what you might be able to do. Um, but we'd love to hear your stories. You can go on leadersoftransformation.com and share with us there. You can go on social media and and find us there as well and share what you're up to or what you're planning to do and how we can support you in doing that. All right. So let's, um, Steve, you know, you've got this, you know, tremendous success behind you. Where did this all, I know because I read the book, but I'd love you to share with our audience where this all started for you. Um, it, I think it started in 1981. Um, and I uh, was a, a small business uh, person in New York City. I grew up in Flint, Michigan, which I'm very proud of. And uh, in Flint, we made all the Chevrolets and Buicks uh, in America and a uh, very successful city at one time. And, um, but I had a very hard time getting jobs growing up because the wage rates were really high. And um, so I got in the habit of starting businesses. Uh, even when I was 10, I had a, a partner, Gary Voigt, uh, who's my best friend. And um, uh, we, would, uh, we had a golf ball business. I was the first Avon male, Avon sales, uh, male Avon sales person in Genesee County in Michigan. Very proud of that. I had a, um, uh, uh, a, a fixture the house up concept uh, i had a, uh, a paper route i had a bike repair uh business i had uh i owned for a while ice cream um uh a machine uh and so i i just got in the habit of thinking 
of myself as self-employed. And I think everyone really is self-employed. Um, even if the government says you're not, or the, um, the corporation you're working for uh, says you're not, I think psychologically to view yourself as an entrepreneur or an intrapreneur, as someone who's trying to maximize their happiness and try to do the maximum amount of good within constraints. Uh, I think that's a very healthy view. Um, I went to college, went to Michigan. Uh, I wanted to be a businessman and I was fascinated by money. And um, I still am, I really like money and talking about it and thinking of ways to make money is a you know, big part of my day. Um, but um, I went to uh, a Ford Motor Company uh, which um, uh, in the international finance area, and I spent three years there, and it was for me it was like nirvana. It was like uh, being in San Diego or something. It was just the world headquarters, Ford Motor Company, tenth floor, and you could see the whole world because Ford was in fifty-two countries, and um, I was in in charge of uh, Venezuela, uh, Ford South Africa, and Ford Aerospace Division. And everything was perfect. And, and But life's never like that, at least my life isn't. When everything's going perfect, I get ready for the bump, you know? And uh, sure enough, um, and it came out of the fact that Ford Aerospace Division, uh, and for South Africa, we're doing business, uh, and uh, South African government was at that time a very racist, apartheid supported. I mean, it's all part of the culture. And Ford, which was very against uh, that type of activity, but wasn't conscious that by selling um, uh, uh, listening devices and uh, all this type of state-of-the-art um, uh, surveillance equipment, they weren't really, their political conscience wasn't raised, even though the vast majority of people there were good and de decent people in every single way. But we sold uh, um, the um, surveillance equipment that the South African government actually used to get find Stephen Biko and who died a, just a horrible, horrible death, tortured to death over a three week period. And thank heavens the men that did that were ended up tried and uh, served um, 15 to 20 years in prison. And, but I by accident discovered that file just because I was the analyst, I wasn't in charge. I was the lowest ranking, like a first lieutenant that would keep track of everything. And upon discovering the documentation, I was like shocked and, um, and started writing memos and creating you know, discussion groups. Should we be selling, supporting uh, governments that are, are tyrannical, uh, governments that exploit people, uh, uh, would disobey every concept in the Constitution and in the Bill of Rights. And as you can imagine, that created a lot of stress uh, there. So um, I was um, uh, asked to um, leave, resign, and they treated me very fairly. And I got, uh, I think, two years severance pay, which was like, you know, a gift from heaven for me. And they said, we will continue to debate these issues. And sure enough, seven years later, they uh, passed at the board level a uh, resolution uh, much different than I'd originally drafted it because I didn't write that well. But it basically said that Ford would not sell to a country um, uh, that was violating the civil rights of, of its um, uh, 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 citizens. And I thought that that was a very beautiful thing. And my life moved on. I became a small business person in New York City. And I love small business. 
And um, I, I feel like I'm talking too much, Nicole. Should I? No, I. This is great. Tell tell about the story of what really caught you um, going to the therapist. Oh yeah, sure. I, I never told the Ford story before. There's something about no, me. and I'm glad you shared that because that really was inspiring to me when you shared that in your memoir. Um, and I was thinking, wow, what you know, this this started very early on for you. Uh, advocating on the behalf of even if you weren't directly connecting with the people in that you're referring to in Africa but you were advocating on their behalf in the way that you could it was something that was your heart it's interesting how our heart shows up in just who we are and you know what we think is right or wrong and how that plays All out the time. into our life but yeah, so you you had this experience in New York City, which totally changed yeah, the I direction. Was, I was I decided to become a small business person and just focus on that, and and try to make a lot of money so that I could help myself, uh, my family, my loved ones, and um, uh, also help uh, people that didn't have the financial resources to start small businesses or to study business because business is a craft and, and studying it, you do get better at it. It's like anything else. So my, again, my life was all set. I was doing well. I had a, a girlfriend and everything was perfect. And out of nowhere comes, a, a, you know, a, a twist. Uh, but I was in broad daylight in 1981 uh, during a crime crime wave in New York, uh, if you look back at the stats, um, New York is one of the safest cities in the world now. But back then, I, I, if I remember correctly, violent crime was eight times higher than what it is now. So it was uh, just a different place. Now you can, you know, it's uh, uh, there are neighborhoods that have no crime. Uh, it's just a, a, a totally changed place. But I was out in broad day um, with my um, friend, and uh, uh, five young men came up to me, about 12, and they were sh shorter than I am. I'm five, uh, six, and, um, and I was 25, 26. So it took me totally by surprise when they um, uh, attacked me with tiny little, like, pen pens and things that could hurt but you know they didn't actually hurt me very much but they embarrassed me in front of my particularly in front of my uh, friend who while I fell down and you know uh, actually started to cry I'm so frustrated she took the initiative much to her credit and uh, started giving orders including asking them to uh, uh, that they were going to be uh, under citizen's arrest. And she pushed one of them away from me. And they were really scared of her. Uh, she was a teacher by trade. And they uh, got all uh, uh, in order and then ran away. And uh, I was very proud of her. But <laughs> on my end, from my point of view, the camera on me, the scene didn't look that good. And I, I felt um, uh, humiliated. Uh, so I, I don't know what causes post-traumatic stress disorder. I've read a lot about it. And sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't. Certain people get it, certain people don't. And you can't really forecast it, but I, like a flu bug, got it. And anybody, any of your listeners who've had post-traumatic stress disorder, or have it now, it is curable and it is very painful because I didn't think about anything other than this um, humiliation, particularly the part with me crying with my friend giving orders like a hero, uh, you know, and <laughs> that was, uh, yeah, that thought must have played over in my head over a thousand times. So I'd be talking to you and that thought would be on my mind and I could barely hear what 
what you said because I'd be thinking about that thought. And it was a subtle kind of torture, which I wouldn't have been able to get through uh, for more than a, a couple of months. I barely made it through a couple of months. And fortunately, I had this unique friend, Ayn Rand. Uh, yeah, I was who, like reading about Ayn Rand and I'm thinking, what? He knows Ayn Rand? <laughs> anyway. Atlas Shrug, for those of you that, that uh, you may recognize that name, it's like, wow. And, uh, reading your, yeah, reading about your interactions with her quite yeah, the, the whole she was, podcast uh, she, herself. And whenever she would um, be too much for me, because she was, uh, you are a mystic fool, you are, you know, uh, um, uh, I, would, I would call her by her real name. Um, uh, Aisha, Aisha Rosenbaum, I'm talking to you. <laughs> and at first you would see the fury rise and then she'd laugh, this deep Russian laugh. So there was two sides to her and we actually were able to become acquaintances. And I actually thought she enjoyed uh, talking to me because she lost her husband who, uh, who she married when she was 25 and she lost him when he when she was 74 and uh, it was very painful for her um, and and I admired her I'm, I don't happen to uh, be an atheist I'm not an objectivist um, but I, I respect you know, I respect, I respect the beauty of individual uh, of allowing individuals that are adults to worship, speak, habeas corpus, freedom of press, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, my grandfather had been her lawyer and said, I've got this eccentric grandson. He's read all your books and you might enjoy talking to him. And, and, and we hit it off, uh, mainly because I never interrupted her. <laughs> but, uh, she noticed that I was talking to myself. So I, I was trying to, here I am, top selling novelist of the last century. Somebody, if you don't agree with her, it's fine. But she, on her own, came to a country with no English, $24, and created a new world for herself. And um, it was quite a, quite a human being. Uh, and was the only person in my life who ever said, the entrepreneur, what you want to do, and the only thing that you've ever been good at, the only thing I've ever been able to do was this entrepreneurial stuff. Right? You know, the, I'm not good in a hierarchy. I had dyslexia. I've had every learning issue you can possibly imagine. And, and I'd fight through it. I'd swim through it. And she was the only one who ever made my character a hero so that I could see myself. And that was a big thing uh, to me. But so one day she's going on and on and on and on about something. And she said, you're not listening to me. And I said, no, I am, I am, I am. I said, no, you're not. No, I am, I am. Uh, you're not listening to me because your lips are moving. Well, I'm talking. What did I just say to you? And she she was right. I wasn't listening because post traumatic stress disorder. You can't listen to other people talk. You pretend to, but what you're really listening to is the part of the brain that's been damaged by not being able to work out this thought that's going over and over again. Increasingly, they're able to actually take pictures of it so that it becomes a real medical issue instead of something that's an hypothesis. And she said, well, I have a friend and you're going to go see him right now. I said, I, I'm, I can't go out on Memorial Day. And she said, you go, you're going to go see him uh, right now. And she called this very famous psychologist up who I highly recommend to your listeners and viewers. Um, he's dead now, but his book's Albert Ellis, uh, and he basically created this very simple process that you could change 
how you felt by changing uh, what you said to yourself, that you could change your feelings based on what you thought. And I'll tell you, it really saved my, my, my life. And she called them up and they were yelling at each other in a manner that I had not heard in the Midwest. I was new to the East and was not used to this particular cultural, cultural way of speaking where you speak directly what you're thinking with no excuse me. I'm sorry. I don't mean to interrupt. I didn't mean to be so harsh. It was, and I admire, I'm not able to do it, but I kind of admired it and got a lot done. Sure enough, he says, all right, I'll see him. Have him get over here. So I actually didn't go that day, but the next morning I went and he helped me a lot. He said, what is bothering you? And I said, well, I was a coward. Um, well, I was, my girlfriend and I were getting mugged. I fell down, I tripped, and and then I was so frustrated, I, I had trouble getting up and I started to cry. And and I, uh, my girlfriend saved me with these five young men. And um, uh, he laughed, he said, I thought this was something serious. <laughs> and, <laughs> which I never really forgave him for that, but he, it's almost a strategy in him actually limiting or reducing the true. Yeah, true. I just thought you're right. You're totally right. And he said, "Now write down what's the sentence that's bothering you." And it was, "I feel chronically humiliated because of these flashbacks I'm having, where I cried while under while young men." were attacking me in front of a woman that I really admired. And he then got up and he edited it. And he said, try this. And it was, <clears throat> I am a hero because under attack by five armed young men who are at the age where they wouldn't know right and wrong, which is there's some truth in that. Um, I was able to handle the situation in such a way that through teamwork, my girlfriend and I were able to prevent anybody from being harmed or any additional uh, uh, assaults. And it changed everything. Um, he made me stay for three hours and write on the board that sentence over and over again. Um, and had two of his graduate students kind of guard me to make sure I did it. But at the end of it, I was really cured. I wasn't, and he comes down, he's all lanky. He's like, he's like a, a grumpy Jimmy Stewart, he reminded me of, and he'd swear a lot. Um, and uh, he'd say, well, are you feeling better now? And I go, yeah, I think I'm, I'm cured. What are, you, what are you thinking about? Well, I'm hungry. I really would want to go get some rigatoni with chicken. All right. Great. All right. Pay, pay my secretary. Thanks for coming over. So I was so happy to be rid of this, um, you know, this affliction. It was horrible. Uh, it, it was the worst illness I ever had, exceeding flu, anything. Next day, get a phone call, gruff, mean. Uh, it's uh, Dr. Ellis, get right up here, Mariotti. Uh, oh, did I do something wrong? No, I want you up here 10 minutes. Um, so I was really worried that I had said something inappropriately. I looked at one of the interns in an inappropriate way that by accident I'd taken something or that I'd paid the wrong amount of money or I'd said something secret about Ayn Rand that I wasn't, you know, I was really uh, thought that I was had done something that I was going to get in trouble for. And I walk in and he goes, you're not well. You kept me up all night thinking 
how are we going to prevent this from coming back? I said, it's not going to come back. There is no way it's going to come back. You cured me. Thank you. And um, I paid you. And I'd like to stay friends, but I'd like to go now. <laughs> but he wouldn't have any of it and said, I want you to flood it. And flooding means, for anyone who's ever had this um, ailment, is if you're uh, afraid to ride in an elevator, you ride in an elevator over and over again. You're afraid of asking out uh, uh, a man on a date or a woman on a date. You do it over and over again. And the hundredth time, it'll be gone. You'll have no fear. Because I've, I've used it a lot in my own life and with kid, young people. He said, you've got to confront this directly. You've got to live it for at least a month. Otherwise, it's a progressive and tricky disease. And he's right on that. You know, today we have 22 uh, suicides a day of our veterans. Mm -hmm. um, almost all are diagnosed with uh, some form of post-traumatic stress disorder. And they'll be treated and they'll be okay. But it, it's a really tricky, difficult mind illness that, that you've really got to pay attention to and not let it creep back in. Um, because somehow it's actually damaged the connections between the dendrites that shock. So eventually I agreed and I started to teach in Bedford Stuyvesant, which at that time was a very difficult neighborhood. And I went to the Boys and Girls High School, which at that time was a very difficult neighborhood. 79 teachers had been assigned there and none of them would go because they had tenure, they could turn it down. But I was asking to go and I wanted to be a special ed teacher, you know, with kids that had a lot of issues, uh, particularly um, behavioral issues. And I, I, I actually thought I could actually help them as well. So, but I, I thought I'd do it a month or two because I, I really wanted to make money. And the minute I walked in, Nicole, it, it was, I, I knew I'd be doing this uh, the rest of my life. I just knew it. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I didn't love it, but I felt like a hero. And I knew that somehow I would get good at it. And um, the first year was torture. Uh, I, I had no control over my classes. Um, I dreaded going to school. I felt chronic anxiety. Um, kids would make fun of me, punk me out, pretend they were going to hit me. Um, kids would come into my class who weren't supposed to be there, and I wouldn't know it. So I, I was always the class clown, fool, frightened. Um, and one of the reasons I wanted to write about this is there are a lot of new teachers that go through, a, in not just this country, all over the world, serious uh, issues. Many of them leave uh, after a year or two, and then they bring in a new crop. And it's very hard to find literature that tells the new teacher what, what it can be like if you're assigned to a difficult school and methodologies that you might be able to use to get through it. Uh, I think it's one of the cr critical issues because to me, education is, if we mess the education up, it doesn't really matter what else we do, in my opinion. Um, it's like what Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis said about raising children. She said, if, if you mess that up, what, what else can you make up for that? And it really, and I feel the same way about education. And what's really concerned me in our country is you very seldom hear it. Um, at least I don't. Um, in the 2016 debates, I did not hear it mentioned once on a national stage. Uh, it was in the last debate briefly for about two minutes, but it was almost like they practiced it. There wasn't any real, why don't we try this? And 
what's particularly frustrating for me is that of the 900,000, these are estimated numbers, about 900,000 children in our country that drop out of school and are really, school's not right for them. And they come from about 600 schools. They're called dropout factories. And no one ever talks about that. It isn't, and I live in Princeton now, almost zero dropouts. Um, Ann Arbor, Michigan, almost zero dropouts. Uh, uh, Peoria, Illinois, almost zero dropouts. It's in specific schools in specific neighborhoods where you will lose over a four year period, you'll lose uh, seven, 800 kids. And the fact that we're not talking about that, uh, I think is, is um, uh, and many, many other issues. Why, why do some kids learn well, others don't? Should we be using a screen as much as we are in the classroom? Should we be using Socratic method more? You, you could spend a lifetime discussing this, and I just don't hear it anymore. In the 60s, I did, and to a degree in the 70s, but I feel we've lost our, our edge uh, as far as discussing what I think is the most important issue. And if I ever ran for president, it's really all I talk about. And because mm -hmm. whoever gets that right, We'll get everything else right, I think. Yeah. Um, but you specifically talk also about entrepreneurship being something, and you discovered something when you were working with these kids. What I what struck me in the book, where you know you were actually getting in trouble because you were talking about money in the classroom, and it's like, really, we can't talk about money? The, the, that's ridiculous. They're going to spend the rest of their lives having to figure out how to make it, keep it, build it, whatever, you know, manage it. And here you're not allowed to speak about it. And then you discovered something where when, when you were trying to teach math, the kids weren't interested. But as soon as you started translating it into, into business, into entrepreneurship, all of a sudden you got their attention because they, they were interested in that. Can you talk about that? that aha or that journey of uh, like how much that really, and I love what you said earlier about we're all entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs um, by nature. And I, I do believe that as well. And uh, it's not a vocation, it's a mindset, it's, it's a way of being. Um, so talk about that aha in the classroom and what that looked like. When I first went in, um, the only, thing I felt comfortable talking about was my little bit of knowledge about small business. And kids were fascinated by it. Uh, a lot of children in poverty think there's one price. So they see this in the store and they think that price is a dollar, not knowing there's a wholesale price, there's a manufacturer's price, there's a jobber price and that there are millions of people that make their livings uh, bringing this thing to retail, this uh, pen. Every product has a huge production structure behind it, many times transcending uh, countries and continents. A lot of low-income people aren't exposed to that. And so I would start talking about that and I would get in trouble and um, because those weren't part of the lessons. And that amazed me because here we are in a situation of extreme poverty. This is 82 in a, a neighborhood where some children who are in foster care wouldn't have any money. And I just did not. And I have had a couple of times in my life where, you know, I lost my wallet or for whatever reason I was totally without resources. And the anxiety was so bad from that, they, I can remember each time when I had no uh, money at all, and it was horrible. These children live like that all the time and are under this constant stress and then have all this anxiety and stress 
that come from um, uh, uh, situations that are that come from social economic uh, um, uh, poverty is my, is my opinion. We could eliminate poverty. We would eliminate most uh, a lot of the problems that we have, and then we could deal with other higher order spiritual problems or um, uh, depression and things like that. But not taking care of that is a mistake. So for the first three months, I did exactly what I was told and followed the exact lesson plans and really had one disaster after another where I wasn't respected as a teacher. Uh, and it was many days almost unbearable because I couldn't get control of the class at all. By control, nothing that I was tr trying to teach or discuss or, or get them to write about or they weren't interested in that. And it was like I wasn't there. And after my first term, um, I got the kids that were the most disinterested in me or had been the rudest to come to a um, the gym and I had a uh, pizza party for them and I wanted to be friends and I wanted to get feedback as how how could this have happened how could I be the worst teacher of the whole school is what I felt like and I said why did you treat me so badly you humiliated me you put um, chalk on my back when I wouldn't know it was there, you put gum on my seat, you'd call me um, midget, uh, you'd make uh, fun all of All sorts me. of profanities, all, yeah. yeah. All, all sorts of unpleasant. Yeah. And the kids said, because you're so boring, it was unbearable. And I said, well, was there ever a time when I wasn't boring? And he said, yeah, when you first started, you were great. We listened to every word. You, you told us about your import export business, how you bring in lady shoes for five dollars, add a dollar on for insurance and freight, and then you take them around Duane Street, Lower Manhattan, and you try to sell them in um, to wholesalers in groups of twelve. And you would try try to sell each at ten dollars, so you get one hundred and twenty dollars minus um, uh, $84 and your profit would be $36. And if you sold 100, which I did one day, you would make $3,600 before tax. And I almost fell off my seat because here's this kid that I would frankly was afraid of, um, who um, uh, appeared to be totally disinterested in in my anything I had to say about anything and I wasn't that interested in what he was interested in which was you know um the beginning of hip-hop I didn't I learned to love it but I, I wasn't at that time we had nothing in common but then suddenly we had everything in common he had recreated a income statement that a uh, MBA at Wharton would would be doing and from that moment on that was January 82 that changed my life and I said I'm on to something here and come heck or high water I'm going to stick with it and and there's this need for low-income children to learn the basics of entrepreneurship and most important ownership how do you own that profit? And um, this is my 40th year in the field. Uh, I've now written um, 44 books and manuals, which I'm very proud of. Wow. And uh, the organization that I founded uh, called Nifty is all over the world. We have a million graduates because this issue of the alienation of particularly a low, a, a child that doesn't have a lot of resources their alienation through these 600 dropout factories or in china maybe it's 2000 dropout factories um is the issue of our time because 
in this country, they be they go into the prison pipeline. Uh, in other countries, they go into militias. In other countries, they become part of other uh, movements, of which many many times are are very anti um, uh, rights for other other people. They're they, they, many times they're angry. Uh, because they feel subconsciously that they've wasted 11, 12 years of their life and don't, don't know basic, uh, don't have a skill. So I, I think talking about this and, and getting these ideas out uh, is extremely important. And um, that's a major reason I wrote this book, uh, to help new teachers who get almost no help once they start. And two, as kind of a plea to our country uh, to let's get in the game. Let's start discussing why is Finland uh, almost zero illiteracy rate? Even with, their dis even with kids with severe learning uh, disabilities, they end up 100% reading and writing. Why is Singapore so far ahead of us in math and, and science? Um, how can we change? How do we get better? What mistakes? We don't talk about that at all anymore. And even smaller groups of teachers somehow have lost that passion of how, how do you be a good teacher and how do you get better? I hope that was of value. Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, one of my mentors, his sister, got into education years ago and started working in the inner cities of, I believe it was Chicago, or maybe it was Detroit, I think it was to Chicago. And uh, Sarah, Sarah Nuri Singer uh, is, her, is her name. And uh, there's another lady, Marcia something, I forget, is it Marcia Brown? Anyway, who was working in that area as well and working with inner city kiddies, kids and um, in the inner cities. And um, they, she was looking at it like it was a different approach. It wasn't teaching entrepreneurship necessarily, but it was teaching in a different way, where, which was much more kinesthetic, which was much mm -hmm. more engaging for the kids. And, um, and she got so much resistance to the way that she was teaching. And the funny thing is she was that kid um, it, that was asking the question, why, why are we doing this? It's stupid. I don't like this. Blah, blah. She was like one of the you know, kids that was always getting in trouble. But then her, uh, my mentor or her brother sent her to this super camp where she got to discover education and learning on a whole different level and, and develop this yearn to learn. And then she went back at 15. So that was at 14, 15 years old, a year later, she was teaching the teachers in her school how to teach more effectively. Wow. And, but, when she, but when she went into education later on, ran up against huge resistance because the school system is like, that's not the way we do it here. And so, uh, you know, that's a whole story in itself. But it's just unfortunate that I think there's a lot of teachers that that start off because they want to make a difference, but then they get caught in this system of like you did in, in, a, in a way initially where it's like, this is not the way we do it. Follow the curriculum and, but the curriculum's broken. So, or it's, it's perfect depending on what you're, you know, what it's designed for. And it's, if it's designed to teach employees and it's designed, actually it's not even good for that in certain schools, of course, because it's not even teaching the basics. But if it's teaching people to think a certain way, then, you know, and, and to conform, then there's a certain element of it that is successful. But the reality, that's not what our world needs. I recently interviewed uh, Vishen Lakhiani from uh, Mind Valley, and it's a completely online program where they're teaching uh, a different way of learning and transforming educational systems. And so this topic is so, I agree with you, it's so important. And you're a demonstration of that with the impact that you've been able to make. And what I love also is these kids, you know, the stories of, um, you know, the success stories uh, from these kids that range from like massively successful to even just being able to take care of their families and take care of themselves is really, really powerful. I'm, a, I'm very passionate about entrepreneurship and I believe that everybody's an entrepreneur. And if we take that mindset 
and, and, and we approach our life that way, you know, things will be different. But in order to do that, you got to have certain, you got to have, and actually these kids that you had in your class, they demonstrate that because if they have this natural inclination. And I love what you said there in the book, you talked about how they were natural salespeople. They're natural negotiators because they had to be, they live in a extremely volatile environment. They had to negotiate for their safety. They had to negotiate. So now if you can translate those skills and apply them to uh, different areas that, you know, like business, they'd be really, really successful. But um, nifty now is like you said, it's all over the world. And um, you know, you've, you, I think you now have someone else who leads it. And um, what is the vision for nifty going forward? It's a foundation. People can, they can still donate to it, I believe. Oh, yeah. It's and so then, and then there's also how can people before we wrap up as, as we wrap up here is how can people get involved? Then go to nifty.com. We'll make sure that's in the show notes, which is yes. NFTE. N NFTE. Yeah. Network for teaching entrepreneurship. Yeah. And so uh, they can com. donate, but they yeah. can, how can, how can they get involved? How can they bring it to their community if they don't already have it in their community? Um, you, the best way to get started, in my opinion, is to go through a nifty uh, teacher training. Okay. And um, talk to the folks at Nifty are excellent. And we just brought it here to Princeton and we're, are right in the middle of our two week um, summer camp. And uh, it, it's a great way to get the business community involved. The teachers are all pumped. And, uh, you know, we've had, I think, eight or nine different entrepreneurs who've never spoken before with kids. They've never been invited to the schools, come in and talk about what they do. And the kids are just fascinated by it. Um, so um, it, it really is not that hard. And if it gets hard, just do it yourself. And with dads and moms who are homeschooling, you can just order the curriculum or order somebody else's curriculum, there's other curriculums other than NIFTY's, and find one that works for you. But every child should learn about small business because it's all over the world and you, you don't want them stuck under a boss that doesn't like them. You don't want them stuck in poverty. You don't want them to be in a job that they hate, which uh, many people are. It's just horrible. And and there's something about the entrepreneurial mind frame, one that can be taught, and that enables one to change one's life easier than people that don't learn it. So that's what Love I want. Mean. Yes. Well, thank you. And I'm going to find out about San Diego, whether we you know what's what's going on in San Diego, because I'm definitely interested in that. And uh, you're like the real life, you know, um, I know the, the movie Stand and Deliver. I forget the name of the gentleman. You know his name. Jaime Escalani was my yeah. uh, role model. I'm yeah, and he was your role model. When I mentioned yeah. it when we were talking and I said, oh, you remind me of uh, the movie Stand and Deliver. And you're like, oh, yeah, I know him. <laughs> Thank you. He, he passed away by, uh, four years ago. Mm. But that, that's my favorite movie, too. I love that movie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So I just thank you so much for um, what you're doing, what you've done over the 40 years and what you're doing. What an inspiration. And, thank um, you. and taking, your, taking your fear, taking the thing that was your greatest struggle and then turning it into something, marrying it actually what you did. There's so much here to unpack. You know, marrying your uh, the fear with your strength and what you were able to create. There's so many lessons in this. So I encourage our listeners to um, re-listen, go and get a copy of his book. It's Goodbye Homie and, uh, oh, could, excuse, excuse me, Goodbye Homeboy. There's a, there's a copy for those of you seeing. So um, how my students drove me crazy and inspired a movement. Now, there, I will tell you that there is foul language in there and so forth. And I appreciate Steve and I were talking about this. He left it in the book because it would have, it would have changed the feel of it. And you get the real raw, this is, 
the life, this is the experience that these kids are experiencing and the, and even how that translates into their language and their, just their whole view on life. And so, um, but just really, really powerful. As I said, I read the entire thing in one sitting um, with a couple of short breaks in between because it was that uh, riveting to me and inspiring to me. So I encourage you to get a copy of that. We'll make sure all of that is in the show notes so you can go on the leaders of transformation.com if you're driving type in Steve and it will uh, it will show up and so you can connect with Steve and see what they're they're doing. Steve, thank you again so very much. And you you have you have started a movement and so one of the things that we're going to be talking over the next number of months is um, uh, really focusing on a, how do you start a movement. So we may have you back and talking a little bit more about that aspect of it. Oh, I love that. Just, a, just a, yeah, such a such an inspiration you are, and so much that we can learn from you. So thank you. Thank you. I enjoy being on very much. It was a pleasure. All right. Well, I believe that leaders of transformation take action. Get a copy of his book. Go to nifty.com and learn more about this and, and learn how you can get involved. It's only through taking action that things change. So uh, I encourage you to do that. Steve has given us a, a lot of ways to be able to apply this if you're a teacher or your parent or whatever. Um, and so I encourage you that. I look forward to hearing your stories. You can go on leadersoftransformation.com, reach out to us through that, or you can go on social media and reach out to us uh, through the social media platforms and let us know if you have questions or comments and of course what you're doing with it. So we look forward to hearing from you and we look forward to seeing you on the next episode of Leaders of Transformation real soon.